My name is uh, Chris Gatani. Um, I have many projects that I work on. Um, one of uh, the, the labs that I run at CMU is called the Cognitive Assistance Lab. So I run this lab with Chieko Asakawa and Jeff Bingham. Um, and the, the whole motivation behind this lab is how can we use AI technology to help blind people access real world information. So we have a couple of projects that we are doing in our lab. Um, one is the smartphone based indoor navigation. And then the other one is uh, personalized object detectors for blind people. So how do, you, how do you allow a blind person to train a computer vision algorithm uh, to take pictures and things like that? And then our third project is this AI suitcase for assistive indoor navigation. So today we're gonna be talking about the smartphone based indoor navigation. And what I'd like to do is just uh, show you a demo of the system first. And then I'm gonna have Vivek come up here and then talk a little bit more about the technical details and how we use the ARIA glasses uh, to help improve the performance of our navigation system. Approaching. Go up to the sixth floor by elevator on your right. Turn around, you might be going backward. Proceed 25 meters and turn right. It's an awesome experience. It makes me feel free to go where I need to go. This morning, I got out of the Uber car, turned on NavCog, and from the outside of the hotel, walked inside into my room without asking anybody for help. It was just great. Champions Club is on your right. I had my phone in one hand, my cane in the other hand. I never walked with such confidence in my life. And my favorite part about it is the ability and confidence that I have to walk somewhere. And when someone stops me and says, do you need some help? I can say, nope, I got it, thank you. And I'm on my way. So All right, so the system that we have right now um, is based off a, of a Bluetooth beacon network. So there's no computer vision that's happening here. Uh, what's happening is we have literally hundreds of Bluetooth beacons uh, taped to the walls inside this hotel, also at Carnegie Mellon University, and the smartphone is reading the RSSI signals and we're doing uh, some kind of a learning-based uh, um, uh, fingerprinting, right? So the system works, it, the, the error is somewhere around six feet, maybe two meters of error. Um, it's, it's right on the cusp of, of being um, just enough accuracy to help a blind person navigate indoors. But if we want to go further, if we want to say things like, okay, we're in front of the elevator and the button is you know, X centimeters away from you, we need better positioning. And so what Vivek is going to talk about is our, our current effort on trying to get the error to become smaller for beacon-based and um, IMU-based smartphone positioning. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so, yeah, like Chris said, like we are using smartphone sensors, and we not just want to do localization, but we also want to do path estimation and turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Uh, we had a long discussion on privacy, and also like all the comments from Armin, J Julian, and Richard. We we wanted to not use cameras and do on-device inference. Uh, limiting ourselves to smartphone sensors, these are the couple of sensors which I'm showing here, which are like Bluetooth, IMU, GPS, and camera, like for privacy reasons and also like other reasons that we discussed already, which was uh, latency as well as power consumption and battery life. Um, we, we are not using GPS and camera, so we are limiting ourselves to Bluetooth and IMU. So let me show you a demo video of our... Uh, yeah, of the system that's running, which is trained with ARIA data and using only Bluetooth and IMU sensors. NSH 4529 is 312 feet away. Turn right in 30 feet. So like Chris said, like there are hundreds of beacons. Probably can spot some of them on the wall here. Approaching. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Depends on the camera. Turn right. Turn left in 88 feet. Yeah, uh, if you look really closely up on the wall, you can probably spot some white beacons on them. Yeah. All right. So moving on, so why did we choose Bluetooth and IMU? So Bluetooth and IMU both have like very complementary uh, features. Like uh, uh, Bluetooth has a, a low report rate of one hertz, whereas IMU is much more high frequency at 100 hertz, can go up to like 1,000 hertz, like the I IMU sensor on ARIA devices are one kilohertz. 
Uh, Bluetooth requires a dense network of beacons. Like Chris said, we have hundreds of beacons. But ARIA, uh, IMU on the other hand, has, does not require any external sensors, right? So you can just use the IMU that's built into the device. Bluetooth provides global positioning, whereas IMU provides relative positioning. Any of you, if you have done any projects with relative positioning, you know like drift is a big problem that needs to be solved, which, we, which Bluetooth can help with. So not just Bluetooth and IMU, we also combine map information. So when I say map, this is different from uh, what uh, was presented before about like moving objects. Here, by map, I just mean the floor plan information, which just shows where the rooms are and where the walkable areas are. We combine them using a map prior network. And uh, we want to use that information using a particle filter to uh, output estimated location. But we cannot provide the map information directly to the particle filter, so we use, uh, we use a embedding network to embed the map information along with the IMU trajectory estimations to generate local, local, uh, location likelihoods, which is then used as weights to weight the particle filters. So let's look at what these location likelihoods look like. So given some past um, odometry output, uh, what, what can be the uh, possible locations that the user is at? So given like five seconds of past history odometry information, and then using, uh, using an uh, IMU-based uh, odometry network to get the odometry information, using that past five seconds of odometry, what is the location likelihood on this given map the user can be? So here I'm showing the odometry information using that red arrow over there. So, and uh, the location likelihoods are show, which we used to train are shown below. So what if that red arrow was on the top left over there? It is a possible uh, likelihood because, uh, um, because there's no obstacles between uh, the starting, the past five traject, the starting of the arrowhead and the end of the arrowhead. Similarly, if it's on the bottom right over there, it's also a highly likely solution. But if it's on the middle where it's passing through some obstacles, this is not very likely. This is shown using that blue area, which is of low likelihood on the, um, the target location likelihood map. Using this kind of location likelihoods, we want to weigh the particles of the particle filter and then output the, uh, and then combine the IMU and BLE locations to output the estimated location. To do this, we use the odometry information and encode that using an LSTM to generate the deep trajectory embeddings. And we use the map information, which is the floor plan images, and encode that using a unit to generate deep map embeddings. These two embeddings are then combined together using a pixel-wise dot product, and the output location likelihoods are then generated. To train this network, to train the map prior network, we use a cross-correlation uh, between the map and the ground truth uh, odometry information, which we get from the ARIA devices, and generate the uh, weighted, uh, and use the weighted MSE loss to train the network. Here are some numbers. Um, Starting with a dense BLE network, so we, we are working with an area of 1250 square meters across two buildings. Uh, sorry, sorry, 1250 square meters each of the two buildings, but I'm evaluating in turn two different buildings. So the, the first column shows the, um, so, sorry, so the dense BLE shows uh, we using 22 beacons across that given area, where you see like this is accurate enough, close to two meters of accuracy. Uh, reducing the number of beacons to four beacons, we, uh, we call that a sparse BLE network, the, the accuracy drops, right? Inertial odometry only um, estimation, which is like a state-of-the-art method of using IMU only to do odometry, we get close to 10 meters of ATE accuracy. And uh, spa combining sparse BLE along with inertial odometry, we get 2.63. Map information with inertial odometry, 2.38. But combining all three, we get uh, accuracy which is really close to that of a dense BLE network. So let's come at the ground truth acquisition we used um, to train this network. So previously, we were using a LiDAR-based system which has a LiDAR, a camera, and IMU sensors, along with smartphones to collect our data. Now we are using the ARIA devices with the smartphone to collect our data. Let's see at what, what changed for us. So in a crowded indoor environment, you see like ARIA is very robust at moving people and um, it does not twist the same way. So the, I, um, the, the, 
the camera plus lidar system we are calling that the stencil so which is shown using the yellow yellow line over there and um, the aria system is shown in blue as you can see the uh, the uh, the stencil line twists with moving people whereas the aria is much more robust for floor transitions for uh, you, uh, when transitioning between two floors using the staircases both systems work decently well but when we go to an elevator um, the stencil which uses the lidar that drifts and twists as we come out of the elevator whereas aria is able to maintain itself as well as if you see the side view which is showing this the elevation there the aria is able to detect the elevation changes whereas the stencil system is not this this what i'm showing this plot over here this is before the aria team did any optimizations on the elevators and they promised us that right now what they have is even better than this with that i would like to thank the whole aria team and all of you all of you for attending this talk and if you have any questions for me or chris we would be we would be happy to answer them Yes, thank you for the, the great talk. Um, it's actually the first time I'm seeing it, so it's really inspiring. <laughs> um, I'm really interested where, you know, what kind of class of applications are within this type of sort of like research process. So this, you know, there was a rig and it was like this and it had these problems. And if we have something that's more robust in these kinds of ways, in this case, it's trajectory estimation, then we can get the ground truth needed, for example, for pri privacy preserving Bluetooth-based localization. Beyond the localization uh, task or, or uh, application, what, what are the kinds of applications can you think of? I guess it's an open invitation for anybody. <laughs> but yeah, certainly the research needs to be done on. Good. Yes, I think the, the question is, was, um, I guess, what are, what are our kind of future research um, directions and in, in the context of devices like ARIA? Yeah. So, um, I think one of the things that we're dealing with is uh, our demo works well at CMU and Pittsburgh International Airport when we have all the students there and we spend hours collecting data. But um, scalability is like a big issue for us. Like if we want to install this, um, you know, at some other airport in some other city, we need a way to be able to collect data, like accurate localization data very quickly. So I can imagine devices like ARIA, like if people are wearing them or we have versions of them on cell phones that use the phone, and then that's going to help us to get the ground truth that we need to, to scale like to the world. I mean, that's, that would be awesome. So that, that is, really is a big barrier for us right now. Yeah. Brilliant. And beyond the navigation application? Um, in terms of application, so uh, I kind of mentioned them earlier for, for our lab. Um, and I think there was some mention of it earlier in some of the earlier talks too. But the ability to be able to build uh, personalized object detectors within your own house, within your own room, with your own op with items that, that belong to you. Um, you know, we did that project because that was a real need for blind people at home. Like they wanted, they have many t-shirts and they don't know which t-shirt they're holding. You know, they'd like to have their own t-shirt detector or, the, or their own mug detector. And so if you do that, then how do you um, allow a blind person to collect data by themselves when they, they don't understand this idea of framing, you know, is the object within the camera's point of view? They have no way of checking. And so how can we use SLAM and feedback to help them build these data sets? So that's another application. And then um, the suitcase is another application. So if you have some kind of hardware that you can hold, like a suitcase, then um, how can we use that to help blind people? And what kind of technologies can we put in there given like the extra power and the computation that we have, you know, and the uh, haptic feedback that we could give to the user? So those are the ones that we're looking into, you know, and I, I'm sure, you know, we could all think of more, more ideas how uh, computer vision can be used to help the blind community. That's great, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I have a quick question. So in the navigation demo, it shows like uh, it can uh, localize the human's per, uh, location and try to provide some uh, navigation guide to the person. Uh, I just wonder, does the system uh, detect the dynamic objects or humans in the current uh, uh, setting? And uh, if not, 
what's your idea for the future research to incorporate those uh, dynamic objects in the navigation problem? Mm. Okay, that's a good question. So, yeah, we actually did, uh, we are making a promotional video once and you know, the blind person who has recorded the video, I remember they, they bumped into somebody because they couldn't see them while we're making the video. So currently, the app only uses Bluetooth beacon signals. So it has no idea uh, about like who's around the, the person or if somebody's in the way. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have that ability. Um, it would be nice if we did. Um, I think to do that, we would need computer vision would be one possible option, right? Uh, other options would be if everybody has a smartphone and there's some <laughs> kind of shared app, then we could localize everybody and you could get some level of, uh, I guess, dynamic person like detection and collision avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think uh, with the suitcase robot, the, the suitcase robot has LIDAR and a stereo camera on it. So that one actually does pedestrian detection, uh, trajectory forecasting, and then collision mm -hmm. uh, avoidance and collision warning. Mm -hmm. So. Cool, yeah, yep. thank you for the answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.